Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Visit the AUA. Good evening and welcome to AUA's Advancing ADT, a guide for urologists and APPs live course. We strive to offer outstanding educational courses and greatly appreciate your evaluations and general feedback so that we can continuously improve our programs. The AUA is accredited by the ACCME and designates this internet live activity for a maximum of one AMA PRA category one credits. Next slide. Next slide, please. Course handouts from the presentations have been made available to you. Please visit AUA University to access the handouts. Evaluations are very important to us. Course evaluations and CME credit will be administered electronically on AUA University immediately following the course. As we at the AUA continue to develop virtual education that meets your needs, we especially welcome your feedback regarding, regarding both the content and format following the program. Please stay tuned for a keyword that will be provided during the webinar. The keyword is used to verify your participation in the webinar. You will need to use this keyword to access the course evaluation, CME credit claim, and certificate. Next slide. All persons in a position to control the content of an AUA educational activity are required to disclose any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest. Please visit the AUA University to view faculty and education council disclosures. Next slide. Coding advice given during presentations are the opinion of the presenters and may not have been vetted through the AUA for accuracy. Please verify accuracy prior to reporting on medical claims. Next slide. The AUA would like to thank My MyoVant Sciences LTD and Pfizer Inc. for providing an independent educational grant in support of this webinar. Next slide. We hope that you will actively participate as you connect and learn from each other during the course. Due to the size of the audience, all participants will be in listen-only mode without video, but we encourage you to ask questions to the faculty at any time using the chat box. Next slide. Finally, I'd like to introduce and extend a special thank you to our course director, Dr. Kristen Scarpato, for her time, talent, and expertise in developing this program. Dr. Scarpato is an associate professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Department of Urology. She is the residency program director and vice chair of education within the department. She received her MD from Tufts University School of Medicine, her MPH from Boston University School of Public Health, and completed her urology res residency at University of Connecticut. She treats GU malignancies with a fo focus on bladder and prostate cancer. She has a strong interest in patient and resident education and serves on several committees. I will now turn the course over to Dr. Scarpato. Good evening and welcome to the AUA's Advancing ADT, a guide for urologists and APPs. This is our activity goal for the evening. This is based on a documented need from the AUA's Advanced Prostate Cancer Global Needs Assessment. Um, and we hope that you find this as a part of a series of educational offerings, very helpful for your own education and patient care. These are our learning objectives for tonight, which you will see on the AUA University. At the conclusion of this activity, participants will be able to identify and treat patients with newly diagnosed M1 prostate cancer with ADT plus additional therapies, analyze the risks and benefits of treatment for M1 hormone sensitive prostate cancer, M0 CRPC and M1 CRPC, and importantly, differentiate between GNRH agonists and GNRH antagonists and understand the newer treatments that are available. Identify opportunities for shared care and team-based approaches for these patients with advanced prostate cancer. And finally, to facilitate discussions with your patients and caregivers regarding ADT and advanced prostate cancer treatment. 
It is my extreme pleasure to introduce our faculty for tonight's course to friends and colleagues who are well known for their expertise in the, in the management of patients with advanced prostate cancer. Meredith Donahue, she's a nurse practitioner at Vanderbilt where she earned her master's in nursing and went on to complete a fellowship um, in, in her nurse practitioner uh, urology role. She is now managing patients with advanced prostate cancer and helps lead our clinic here. And Alicia Morgans, Dr. Morgans is well known in the world of prostate cancer. She's a GU medical oncologist and the medical director of the survivorship program at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She has collaborated with the AUA and many prior experiences and is a member of guideline panels. And uh, we appreciate both of them joining tonight as our faculty experts. As Barbara mentioned previously, we hope that you will actively engage us throughout the program, interact, and you may use the chat box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Finally, get social with us, share your highlights with the global urologic community, and don't forget to tag the AUA. Before we begin the live panel discussion, please participate in this brief pretest. This is a knowledge assessment. At the close of today's discussion, we will have follow-up assessment using these same questions. And the results of these assessments will help the AUA measure the educational effectiveness of this live educational activity and then aid in the successful planning and development of future activities. At this time, we are going to begin the pretest using a Zoom poll. Question one, which of the following mechanisms of action describes GnRH agonists, stimulates release of LH from the pituitary, increasing FSH and decreasing LH via feedback loop? binds to receptors to block release of GnRH, decreasing FSH and preventing testosterone surge, blocks cytochrome P450 enzymes, decreasing androgen production, blocks androgen receptor and decreases AR-mediated transcription. Question two, which one of the following mechanisms of action describes GnRH antagonists, stimulates release of LH from pituitary, increasing FSH and decreasing LH via feedback loop, binds to receptors to block release of GnRH, decreasing FSH and preventing testosterone surge, blocks cytochrome P450 enzymes, decreasing androgen production, blocks androgen receptor and decreases AR-mediated transcription. Question three, many patients develop castration resistance. All of the following are possible escape mechanisms for prostate cancer in the development of castration resistance, except overexpression or amplification of the androgen receptor, 
androgen receptor gene mutations that allow non-androgen ligands to bind and activate the androgen receptor, Synth synthesis of androgen receptor variants that are more dependent on the androgen ligand for activation, development of non-androgen receptor mediated pathways for maintaining cell survival. Question four, which of the following is true about ADT? GnRH agonists cause an initial flare of testosterone that lasts for a few months as treatment, at treatment initiation. Surgical ADT options can include castration through bilateral orchiectomy and adrenalectomy. GnRH antagonists do not cause an initial flare of testosterone at initiation of treatment. Patients with impending cord compression or urinary outlet obstruction may benefit from GnRH agonist treatment with more rapid suppression of testosterone levels than with GnRH antagonist treatment. Question five, y'all are doing great, we're getting there. Which of the following scenarios accurately describes treatment intensification, including the correct advanced prostate cancer patient population and combination of agents? Patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer can be treated with ADT plus bicalutamide, abiraterone acetate, enzalutamide or apalutamide to prolong survival. Treatment of patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer with ADT plus abiraterone acetate, darolutamide, or enzalutamide is associated with overall survival. Treatment of patients with non metastatic CRPC includes the addition of abiraterone acetate, darolutamide, or enzalutamide to ADT, as this demonstrated improved metastasis free and overall survival where patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer can be treated with ADT plus docetaxel plus darolutamide or abiraterone to prolong survival. Question six and our final question, consideration of which of the following complications is important when starting ADT. ADT has been associated with metabolic changes and can increase cholesterol and abdominal adiposity and induce insulin insensitivity. Treatment with GnRH antagonist 
Relugolix has been associated with a lower rate of cardiovascular events than treatment with GnRH agonist lupuli. Several population-based studies suggest there may be a higher incidence of dementia in patients receiving ADT than prostate cancer patients who have not been exposed to ADT or all of the above. Great. Well, now let's get into it. We are going to start with historical perspectives and the HPG axis. So prostate cancer is well established to be an androgen dependent disease. And we know this based on early work from Huggins and Hodges. And this is Nobel Prize winning work. The androgen receptor is highly expressed on prostate cancer cells. It's stimulated by androgen, primarily testosterone is what we're talking about. With prostate cancer, we see testosterone bind to the androgen receptor to promote survival, growth, and proliferation. With ADT, we see regression of disease, and this is uh, typically through reducing levels of androgen or blocking the effects of the androgen. ADT can be utilized in the localized prostate cancer management or in advanced disease. And we are primarily going to be talking about advanced disease tonight. I wanna start by getting into some important um, mechanisms of testosterone suppression. Dr. Morgans, can you please walk us through the HPG access under normal conditions and then discuss how it may be manipulated in the management of prostate cancer? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. So it's really important, I think, to recognize that ADT is not a direct effect on prostate cancer cells. So these treatments do not act directly at the level of the prostate cancer cell. Rather, a GnRH agonist or antagonist is actually going to act at the level of the pituitary gland and hit that GnRH receptor. Um, this will cause actually an increase in FSH and LH production, which then stimulates the testes. The LH will stimulate the testes to make testosterone. Um, this, is, this is what an agonist is going to do because of course it's a stimulant and agonist on that GnRH receptor. That initial surge is going to stop because ultimately the, the pituitary gland is going to downregulate the GnRH receptor. As it downregulates it based on feedback loops, then FSH and LH levels will drop. FSH levels, not quite as much as LH perhaps, but either way, testosterone secretion dramatically decreases. I should note that about 10% of testosterone is made in the adrenal gland. So there is some remaining testosterone in the system, but there's an initial surge, then a downregulation of that GnRH receptor, and then a decrease in testicular production of testosterone. A GnRH antagonist is a little different. It's a little less roundabout. So it's going to just be an antagonist on that GnRH receptor at the level of the pituitary, decrease uh, FSH and LH, decrease testosterone production from the testicle. So that's, that's different. And of course, on the right side of this slide, you can see that we can use surgical approaches to also achieve um, surgical levels of, of castration by just doing a bilateral orchiectomy, which can decrease testosterone production from the testicles because obviously they're going, the, the testosterone producing portion, if not the entire testicle is removed surgically. So lots of, lots of options here, um, but they are, they have their little nuances. And, and so it's important to understand how they can be different. Great. And what are some of the key differences between GNR, GNRH agonists and antagonists that are important for clinicians to know? So, um, so great question. The antagonists do achieve a faster testosterone suppression or cash rate level of testosterone, which you can see here happens on average in around 96 hours 
versus about three to four weeks with an agonist. Because I did mention, remember, there's that surge or increase in testosterone before there's the downregulation of the receptor and a decrease of testosterone levels. So that agonist is going to come with something called a flare, which you can see in the second line here. There is no flare with an antagonist. Um, and generally, I would say they have similar levels of, of PSA control. So disease control or or cancer related efficacy for both of these approaches is considered quite similar, um, but, but there are differences obviously in the, the how quickly they act. I should also mention that Relagolix, which is one of our GnRH antagonists, when we stop that treatment, it does seem to lead to faster recovery of testosterone levels to normal than, um, than Luprolide, which was compared in the HERO trial, which we will talk about later. Um, finally, I should mention that Digorelix, which is our GnRH antagonist that is injected, does come with a higher rate of injection site reaction than our GnRH agonists. Um, and that is something that can be really important from a patient perspective. And the GnRH agonists come with different durations of depo that can give a lot of flexibility if there is an in injection version that, that is preferred by the clinician or by the patient. So one month, three months, four months, six months, there's even a 12 month um, uh, depo that you can use. And finally, sometimes clinicians do think about you know, it, there are situations where we want to achieve a very rapid suppression of testosterone. These could be in situations where you have cord compression or impending um, bladder outlet obstruction. And in those situations, a GnRH antagonist may be preferred just to get the more rapid suppression of testosterone without the flare. Great. And we hear so much now about ADT and anti-androgens, first generation, second generation, and a lot of different terms novel hormonal therapies, androgen targeted therapies. Um, and you see a list here on this slide, certainly not exhaustive, but many of these agents are given in conjunction and we're gonna get into that um, tonight, but certainly a lot to remember. Meredith, uh, we're talking about ADT tonight and its, its potential benefits. Can you get into some of the, the, these benefits for our audience? Sure, sure. Um, and Dr. Morgan, mentioned um, quite a few of these, but of course our first benefit is cancer regression. Um, decreasing and there by cancer regression, we're gonna see a decrease in PSA, um, but also symptom management. Certainly not every patient is coming in with symptoms due to their advanced prostate cancer, but the big ones would be bladder outlet obstruction leading to urinary retention, um, cord compression, and also generally bone pain, um, I would say is probably what we see the most and getting them started on hormone therapy can relieve those symptoms pretty quickly. Yeah, so really important benefits for, for patients. And as you said, cancer regression, we can monitor that in many different ways. We're following these patients with PSA, we're following them with imaging. And so we can see changes there in addition to relief of symptoms and overall survival. In 2020, the AUA, in conjunction with other organizations, ASCO, ASTRO, SUO, um, even patient advocates, puts together an advanced prostate cancer guideline. And so if you could just set the stage for us, Meredith, for the rest of the discussion tonight about the different disease states that are really neatly outlined and some of the important definitions in this guideline. Yeah, I think it's important we spend a minute on this slide. Um, first, I like to kind of look at this and think about this with just looking at the left hand side. Um, and we have four main disease states. So biochemical recurrence, metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, non-metastatic castration resistant, and metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Starting with biochemical recurrence, so this is a rising PSA after exhausting all local therapies with no evidence of metastatic disease on imaging. Um, that I find even that one is sometimes the hardest one to, to get your brain around. Um, but then we get into metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So that is prostate cancer that has spread outside um, outside of the pelvis with a PSA that responds to initial hormone therapy. Within that, we're also talking about the high volume metastatic disease. 
So that's the number of lesions that the that the patient has on imaging, as well as high risk metastatic disease. Um, those high risk patients with metastatic disease are um, have Gleason eight or higher on their initial pathology, um, and or three or more bone lesions as and uh, measurable measurable visceral metastatic disease. Once we get through that, then patients can progress into the metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, which is disease has spread outside of the pelvis and PSA and or on imaging, we see progression of disease. So a rise in PSA or um, change in imaging, progression on imaging. And then the non-metastatic non -metastatic castration resistant, um, that's where we see the patient Never had, Im never had metastatic disease proven on imaging. They get started on ADT, but we see the PSA rise despite being on hormone therapy. And that's probably a disease state that we're going to see some changes in with, with advanced imaging. Um, and we already are starting to see changes, but um, thank you for laying that out. I think it's important when you have a patient in front of you with lots of information and past medical history to sit down and try and categorize them into each of these four advanced prostate cancer disease states before moving on to what is the management, what is a recommendation, and how can we best care for these patients. All right, so now getting into the really exciting part of tonight, let's talk about some recent advancements in ADT. There have been several FDA approvals of novel hormonal therapies for androgen blockade and newly published data supporting combination therapies for treating these patients. So it's certainly now more complex. It's rapidly evolving. And urologists and APPs, we must stay apprised of all of these advancements to appropriately manage our patients. So I want to start by talking about biochemical recurrence after exhausting local therapy. First, Meredith, if, if you could just, um, again, define what biochemical recurrence is for these patients and then talk about how you monitor them and how you manage these patients. Yep, sure. So again, biochemical recurrence is a rising PSA after exhausting local therapy with no evidence of metastatic disease on imaging. Um, of course, the, the risk with this and monitoring PSA is disease progression. And in these patients would be um, metastatic disease. So how do we, how do we monitor this? How do we manage this? Um, fortunately or unfortunately for us, there's no exact guideline on how to manage patients with a biochemical recurrence. Typically, I'll and there's and there's no um, no data to suggest yet with early versus delayed ADT. So when to start it, we're not sure yet. Typically, and what I've learned through the years working with different doctors is starting with looking at their initial grade grouping. What was their initial pathology? Were they high risk, very high risk, intermediate risk? Um, and then I look at the the PSA exactly what the their PSA is. Is it really low, under one? And then arguably, I would say more important than the actual value of the PSA is the PSA doubling time or how quickly the PSA is rising. Um, right. Yeah, I think, I think historically we would just knee jerk start ADT in all these patients and the guideline pretty explicitly says, we should not routinely initiate ADT in these patients, just as you said, um, but we can continue, we can consider clinical trial enrollment for these patients, or for certain patients, we can consider, based on those parameters you mentioned, initiating intermittent ADT. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? Yeah. So again, with the intermittent ADT, we're looking at all those, those different parameters, but once, once a patient and I decide that they should start hormone therapy, um, again, usually that's based on PSA doubling time, certainly a doubling time under 12 months. Um, some people would argue under 10 months, but under 12 months, I'm bringing up that conversation. Um, 
once we decide to start hormone therapy, typically what I'll do is prepare them for a full year. Say you're getting a year of hormone therapy. And then at that year mark, assuming their PSA is dropped to undetectable, completely undetectable levels, then we can bring them off of it and go back to monitoring PSA. Um, now that we have more GNRH antagonists available with Rolugolix, um, monitoring PSA on intermittent hormone therapy it is different because when someone receives the an anti or I'm sorry an agonist, it's going to be months until their testosterone starts to rise again. With the antagonist, we know their testosterone starts rising much quicker, so we need to watch that PSA closer. And Dr. Morgans, for a patient with newly diagnosed metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, uh, Meredith had briefly touched upon how you subclassify these patients, but if you could just again highlight how you subclassify these patients and then um, note in general how you manage patients with this disease state. Sure. So for metastatic hormone sensitive disease, um, we really think about whether that patient is de novo metastatic. So first diagnosis of prostate cancer, and they already have radiographic evidence of metastatic disease, or if they have recurrent metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, where they may have had a prostatectomy or radiation to treat a localized prostate cancer in the past. De novo metastatic uh, prostate cancer is considered to be more aggressive in most cases and potentially a poorer prognosis, we often want to address that with a more aggressive treatment approach upfront. So it's just something to note, and we'll get to that when we talk about treatment combinations and how we might use more intensified um, combinations to address that de novo metastatic setting. The other breakdown that we use with hormone sensitive disease is whether that patient has high volume or low volume disease. And high volume disease in this setting is defined as patients who have either visceral metastases or who have four or more bone lesions with at least one outside of the axial skeleton. So more bone lesions um, you know, is going to be a high volume patient. Anybody who doesn't fall into that category is going to be a low volume patient. Um, again, high volume patients generally considered to have a more aggressive disease biology, maybe a poorer prognosis. So we often find that we do try to be more aggressive with some of our treatments. And interestingly, I think some of the treatments um, the data suggests that some of our treatments may be more effective in that high volume setting than in the low volume setting. And before you get into some of the specifics of how to manage these patients, I want to just reiterate that what Meredith has said is for biochemical recurrence after exhausting local therapy, we are not routinely initiating ADT monotherapy. And I want to ask you now, very pointedly, for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, should patients be receiving ADT monotherapy? So thank you for the question. And the answer is absolutely no. They should be getting systemic therapy, but it should be an intensified strategy that includes ADT and something else. Importantly, I, I think we should acknowledge that as a community, as a cancer treatment community, we are failing in this regard with about half of patients in the United States in urology practices and in medical oncology practices, still getting ADT alone. But as you can see on this slide, the level one evidence from phase three trial after trial demonstrates that combinations of something plus ADT beats ADT alone in every single trial, both in terms of disease control, overall survival, progression-free survival, and other uh, meaningful metrics in terms of that, as well as in quality of life maintenance or even improvement in many settings. So ADT plus something is standard of care. And I am particularly interested in hearing tonight about treatment intensification. And Alicia and I had a little discussion about this earlier. Is treatment intensification tri triplet therapy the way that I think of it, the bottom two um, studies here that um, she will talk a little bit about, or is it just adding another agent to ADT, and, and hopefully we're getting to the point where intensification means adding a third agent, not just adding something on top of ADT, given this really strong evidence for combination therapy. But if you could talk us through the newer exciting data about this triplet or uh, treatment intensified management strategy. 
Sure, of course. So we can see here the piece one and Arison's trial. We'll start with piece one. This included patients in a European trial in which all patients had de novo metastatic disease. They could have had high volume or low volume disease when they were enrolled. And there was a sort of complex randomization strategy that included ADT with or without docetaxel plus abiraterone versus ADT with or without docetaxel alone versus ADT with or without docetaxel and radiation to the primary versus ADT, docetaxel, abiraterone, and radiation to the primary. Um, that, of course, sounds complex. It is complex. There were over 1,200 patients in this trial. The radiation data is not yet mature, and so the investigators were able to combine the arms that included um, ADT, docetaxel um, together, and then the ones that included ADT, docetaxel, and abiraterone to try to get a sense of whether adding abiraterone to ADT docetaxel would actually improve disease control outcomes for their patients. What they found is that when they compared ADT docetaxel versus ADT docetaxel abiraterone, there was a clear benefit of about two years in terms of prolonged progression-free survival in the overall population. And there was an improvement in overall survival that met statistical significance in the high volume metastatic hormone sensitive population in data that's been released. The data for the low volume population is not yet mature. So we are waiting on that, we will see. But as an overall population, there was an improvement in overall survival to the triplet, ADT docetaxel abiraterone versus ADT docetaxel. Again, remember, a de novo metastatic patient population. So in the Arisens trial, it was definitely simpler. Uh, this included patients who had de novo or recurrent disease, but a vast majority of the patients had de novo metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. The trial was not designed to really help us understand, at least from the beginning, whether patients had high volume or low volume. There will be um, data released at GU ASCO actually doing a, a kind of a look back or retrospective analysis by volume, but we don't have that initially. So we just know that there were a predominance of de novo metastatic patients and probably there was a larger proportion of high volume metastatic patients. In any event, patients were enrolled were randomized to receive ADT docetaxel versus ADT docetaxel and darolutamide. And the addition of darolutamide to ADT docetaxel was associated with improved overall survival in this overall population. And actually the two trials, PEACE-1 and Aracens, led the NCCN to actually update their guidelines such that ADT docetaxel, which used to be chemohormonal therapy, is actually no longer recommended as a combination in itself. If you're going to give ADT docetaxel, the NCCN at least now recommends that you either add darolutamide to that or abiraterone to that because the evidence is so convincing for patients getting ADT chemotherapy, we need to add one of those AR targeted agents because there's clear disease control benefit. Wow, a lot, lot of exciting updates. So I think, uh, you know, just to sort of drive the point home, in terms of treatment intensification, let's get into what I consider the nitty gritty. So you have a patient in your office who has metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Are they all getting this tri triplet therapy treatment intensification or are you reserving it for certain patients and why? So I, I actually do use a lot of triplet therapy. I think that for many men, receiving six cycles of docetaxel as it's done in this hormone sensitive setting is usually easier than receiving up to 10 cycles in the metastatic castration resistant setting. They're also usually more physically fit and able to get chemotherapy in this earlier phase of their disease than when they're a few years older and have disease progression and, and then may get chemotherapy in a later stage. So I am often doing this, but I am definitely prioritizing patients who have de novo metastatic disease. They're all really having that conversation. And patients who have high volume disease, also I'm really prioritizing the conversation. I think that the data suggesting survival benefit is the most clear in that population at this point in time, though the progression-free survival benefit 
benefit does extend to the low volume patients too. And I think especially in patients who have borderline situations, maybe um, maybe recurrent disease, but high volume or, or something that's a little more mixed, if they're young and fit, in many cases, they opt for this triplet. I would also say that a lot, doing this all up front does give us the opportunity to use things like lutetium earlier on in their sequencing pattern because they will have had progression of disease on an AR targeted agent and docetaxel by the time they progress to MCRPC. And when you're deciding which agent to use in your triplet therapy, darolutamide or abiraterone, um, is there any advice you can give folks? Sure, I think that the, the standard things apply. If you have a patient who really can't get steroids, darolutamide is an easy option. Um, there are medication interactions for both of these agents that you need to be aware of. And so that can help guide decision-making. Um, and I think that insurance actually helps us make this decision frequently too. So um, either way, I do think that patients getting one of these agents are going to be well cared for. So just getting in one is the, plus that docetaxel and ADT is really the, the bottom line. Great. And with increased therapy or intensification, have patients noted any uh, additional problems with side effects or what has the patient experience been? I think that docetaxel of all the chemotherapies that are available in oncology care is one of the, I don't want to say the word gentle, but is one of the less um, less toxic in terms of the overall symptom burden, especially because we use it in prostate cancer as a single agent rather than in combination chemotherapy, as we sometimes do in things like breast cancer, or you may see you know, bone marrow transplant patients or lymphoma patients who get four chemotherapies in combination or multiple. Um, it is given as an outpatient. It does cause some neuropathy. It does cause some fatigue. It generally has relatively mild um, immunosuppression. So it can cause neutropenia in some patients, but many patients get away with not even becoming neutropenic. So it's, it's not as toxic as many um, people imagine chemotherapy can be. And I think in, in most of our practices, we are able to get patients through, even though they may be hesitant, I think once they start in, in general, they tolerate it really well. And in and our chemotherapy trials, most patients in the hormone sensitive setting get five or six cycles. I think the majority actually get six of six planned cycles in these studies. So that suggests that we are able, at least in a clinical trial populations, relatively uh, frequently able to get patients through treatment. All right. Thank you for that. So Meredith, now I want you to talk about this new kid on the block that's really exciting. For so long, we've been providing injectable ADT, and now we have this oral agent. So what is this FDA approval based on? Can you talk us a little bit through the HERO study? Sure. Yep. So uh, Relygolix was approved in December 2020 based on the um, HERO study. It was a phase three randomized trial with a primary endpoint end of sustained castration through 48 weeks. Um, it is an oral tablet taken once daily. The initial dose is, or the loading dose on day one is 360 milligrams. From there on, um, 120 milligrams a day. I think um, a couple important things to take away from the from the HERO trial and looking at um, GNRH antagonists versus agonists. Um, men were were randomized two to one to receive Relugolix versus uh, Luprolide. And again, primary endpoint was sustained castration through 48 weeks. But a couple other things to point out with the HERO trial. Um, testosterone at day four of receiving, of starting treatment uh, with Relugolix was 38. And the mean testosterone for men receiving Luprolide was 625. On the other end of it, um, 90 days after completing treatment, the mean testosterone for men receiving Relugolix was 288. And for men who had received Luprolide, their testosterone was 58.6. So remember those numbers as we, as we talk through uh, this, this new therapy. 
And so now I'm going to ask you the nitty gritty questions. You have a patient sitting in front of you in your office. He needs to start ADT therapy. Are you counseling all patients that Religolix is the way to go? Which patients are you using it for and why? Yeah, there's a lot of factors in, that goes into this decision-making. Um, first thing I think about, is this a patient that I want to avoid the testosterone surge? Um, of course, those are the ones with high volume metastatic disease, um, significant bone lesions, they're having pain. So if I wanna avoid the testosterone surge, then I will encourage towards Relugolix. Um, other patients to consider this in, it has shown to have fewer side effects, um, including the hot flashes, fatigue, lethargy, um, as well as cardiovascular risk, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so if you have a, a gentleman who maybe received six months of ADT for during their treatment, initial treatment for prostate cancer, and they say, no way, I'm not starting that again, um, due to the terrible side effects, this is a good option to offer them. Something else I, I really take into consideration is um, reliability of the patient, kind of in a couple ways. One, are they, are they gonna take their medications every day? Um, or also a benefit of a patient getting the, the three month injection or the six month injection is, you know they're gonna en end up back in your clinic. So, and you can check that PSA versus if this is someone who tends to cancel appointments, not show up to appointments, you lose track of them easily. Maybe it's better to put them on an injectable where you can help keep track of them and um, monitor that PSA and testosterone. I think patient experience so far, it's relatively new. Like Dr. Morgan's um, mentioned, oftentimes insurance is making this decision for us, but we're getting to use this more and more overall patient experience has, has been well. Men still have side effects. Um, I think anecdotally speaking, I'm still seeing if the side effects are better than the, than the injectables. All right, well, let's, um, let's move into the next segment, which is considering the side effects. We've now gone through all these great benefits that are associated with ADT, but certainly there are side effects to consider and they may impact our selection of agent. So if you could talk us through some of the known and well-established side effects of ADT, that would be great, Meredith. Yeah, the, the big ones I usually start with with men is hot flashes, fatigue, lethargy, um, loss of muscle mass. Those are the kind of the big ones that they will notice. And I explained to all men that some men are absolutely miserable and some men hardly notice any side effects at all, but most men are somewhere in between where they do have these side effects, it's bothersome, um, but we can kind of get them through it. Other, other important um, side effects for us to manage is loss of bone mineral density, which as we age is happening anyway. So we're we need to be aware of that. And we're gonna discuss more about the monitoring of bone health. Um, and then of course the weight gain, cognitive decline, cardiovascular disease is a big one that we'll get into further here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Morgans, I would love for you to talk us through some of the important ADT effects in terms of cardiovascular risk. And there's been a lot of attention on that and partly based I think on the HERO study. But uh, why don't you share some of your thoughts on that? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. First, I would say that when we think about cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors, over 90% of our patients are going to have some combination of these. And that includes things that are lifestyle type issues, um, as well as uh, overt diagnoses. So things like hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, hypertension, uh, as well as obesity. These are things that are really, really common in our patients. And they all come together um, and are all worsened in many ways when we add in androgen deprivation therapy and, and hypogonadism 
fanaticism, which is really the driver of all of this. We can see in the figure on the left that we do see that patients develop increases in BMI, decrease in lean muscle mass or sarcopenia, as well as an increase in fat mass, so an increase in adiposity around the abdomen. We also see pretty quickly increases in triglycerides, total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL. And of course, we know that increased HDL is a good risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but that's a, not a significant enough increase in a good risk factor to offset the increases in the other forms of cholesterol that are also increasing in the setting of hypogonadism induced by ADT. We can see on the right um, what I think is a really interesting and not disputed aspect of ADT, um, although there is a lot of consideration around some factors associated with ADT. It decreased insulin sensitivity, increased fasting glucose, and increases in hemoglobin A1C happen, and they happen relatively quickly. We can see the decreased insulin sensitivity within 12 weeks of starting ADT, and this has been well documented. So these metabolic derangements can be really additive, and if a patient is on the edge of having cardiovascular disease or has metabolic dysfunction to begin with, we really can push them over the edge in terms of having a cardiovascular event or developing worsening cardiovascular vascular disease. And in light of the recent HERO trial and the attention on cardiovascular events, can you just share some of the findings there that are really important takeaways? Sure. I think this was, I think, um, quite a striking uh, bit of information that came out of the HERO trial, which, as we heard from Meredith, was really designed with a primary endpoint to understand whether the GnRH antagonist Relagolix would achieve similar levels or, or superior levels of castration and sustained castration as compared to the GnRH agonist Luprolide. What we also saw in collection of adverse events, this was a specifically identified adverse event of interest, was that major adverse cardiovascular events or maces were more common in the first 48 weeks of follow-up as we can see in this particular figure um, among patients treated with luprolide then among patients treated with relagolix. This was an adverse event of interest because there had been multiple phase two trials that suggested that GnRH antagonists may have lower rates of these cardiovascular events, but it was really interesting to see it prospectively. And I would also say that it was really interesting. Uh, I've been treating these patients for a long time and to see the numbers and to see such a high rate of MACE in patients just being treated for the first year after starting their ADT was, was striking even to me. I, I, I hope that this is not happening in my practice. In any event, though, um, there was a 54% relatively lower risk of having these maces in patients treated with relagolix. In the interest of time, I'm going to mention that we know that ADT has an impact on bone health, and this particular population is at risk given their age, given the potential for bony metastases. And so we need to be able to um, appropriately assess our patients for their bone health and their risk of fracture. There are guidelines available for that. There's a risk calculator, the FRAX, the FRAX risk calculator. And we should really be treating all of our patients with adequate doses of calcium and vitamin D for these guidelines to help mitigate the side effects and the risk associated with ADT on our patients' uh, bone health. I wanna finish this segment by just sharing opportunities for multidisciplinary teams. One of the reasons that I love advanced prostate cancer is the opportunity to collaborate with advanced uh, nurse practitioners, medical oncologists, urologists, pharmacists are certainly very important. We've heard about cardiac health. And so I just want a quick um, comment from each of you on the importance of multidisciplinary care and who you routinely interface with to optimize outcomes for your patients. Uh, Meredith, I'll start with you, please. Okay. Um certainly agree with with all of these examples um two other pieces to the pie that i would add um would first be genetic counseling um we at, at vanderbilt we are doing point of care testing point of care germline testing um and as well as somatic testing so when we get those especially that germline testing when we get those results back um, and it shows a pathogenic mutation or a variant of uncertain significance, we can 
get them right into our hereditary cancer clinic um, with genetic counselors. The other, the other piece of the pie that I would add here is our psych onc colleagues. Um, and I know this is something that I need to utilize more. Um, but I find in these, in these men, not only are we telling them they have a terminal metastatic malignancy, um, but we're also starting them on a therapy that causes emotional, um, emotional ability and it can cause depression and um, the weight gain and all these things that, com that already contribute to depression and, and anxiety. anxiety. Um, meanwhile, they're trying to cope with having this diagnosis. So those are my other two that I would add. I think, I think that those are fantastic and um, I would add the same. I would also say um, folks like exercise physiologists, trainers, and, and people who help keep patients engaged with physical activity with our, our teams and even in the community are huge um, important members because they help pr to prevent frailty, help to maintain um, patients' independence, maintain their muscle mass, try to prevent that loss and try to prevent them from gaining weight. Um, and I would also add on um, sexual health medicine folks, because what I think is interesting and, and something that I don't think I fully appreciated when I was early on in my career is that we make dramatic changes to patients in terms of their sexual health. And, and that's obvious with androgen deprivation therapy and the reduction of libido and, and all of the changes. And, and of course, the psychological changes that come with that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't support patients in those ways. And so engaging with team members, whether they're in urology, behavioral health, or otherwise to help support that part of patients' lives, I think is, is really, really important. And hopefully something that we're also doing increasingly in our advanced and, and localized prostate cancer clinics. All right. Well, I have you both up. I'm going to ask a couple questions from the chat before we get into our um, final segment and the wrap-up questions. Dr. Morgan, is there a survival difference between intensifying the treatment with triplet therapy versus adding another agent when treatments fail with the double therapy? So I think that's a difficult question to answer and not one that's not ever been addressed in a clinical trial. But what I can tell you is that Anytime we add a treatment at the time of failure, we are essentially losing time. Um, and usually our treatments when added later on in disease settings, earn us less bang for our buck. So when we added chemotherapy in the metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer setting, we improved survival when that docetaxel was first added by about two and a half, three months on average in the clinical trial, which sounds very low. But when we added it in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, particularly in the high volume disease patients, we improved survival by somewhere around 17 months or something like that. It was like ridiculous. So when we can add things earlier, I think we're able to better address um, clones and that heterogeneity of disease earlier on, reduce disease burden and get more bang for our buck. And, and just to be clear, there are a lot of people who say, well, I won't intensify by adding even a second, a, an AR targeting agent onto my ADT if I had a really good PSA response in the first place. That's actually not how the studies were designed. We add what we add because we, we saw that when we do that all at once up front, we get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, so, so just not a good rationale to add later on. All right. And would either of you use Relegolix instead of Luprolide in combination with docetaxel and um, plus minus a second generation anti-androgen anti for hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer? Absolutely. Yep. I think the data supports that. All right. Why don't we get into the questions? I'm going to advance us to the questions in the interest of time. There's a case that's included in your um, in your documents as well, that it's helpful to sort of put everything together, highlighting the fact that comorbidities are important when treating um, our prostate cancer patients in terms of deciding which agents to use, that most patients, if they're on therapy for long enough, will go on to develop castration resistance. And there's a number of different me mechanisms whereby that happens. Um, so that concludes our program for today. You may go to the AUA University and claim CME credit. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, especially so late, and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>